Welcome to another pre-lab video here for our Chem 1212 lab in North Georgia. Uh, this week we're going to be taking a look at Le Chatelier's principle uh, and the idea really of chemical equilibrium. So <clears throat> a couple things here kind of from a background standpoint uh, for those of you that haven't gotten too far into this uh, yet in the lecture. Uh, chemical equilibrium when we talk about it, sometimes you might hear it called dynamic equilibrium also. Uh, it's really just this point where if a reaction goes on long enough, its concentrations eventually kind of equilibrate to where they're not changing anymore. So those concentrations basically become constant. Now, how this actually goes about occurring, uh, I think there's a common misconception that the reaction basically has stopped happening once those concentrations are constant. But the reality is what's happened is the reaction's still going, but now you just have a forward and reverse reaction that are both occurring, and they're occurring at the same speed, so it kind of gives this uh, appearance that your concentrations are constant. So it kind of almost looks like the reaction stopped, but the reaction never really stops. It's still constantly going forward and backwards, uh, and that's what gives us what we call this kind of equilibrium state. <clears throat> now, when we talk about equilibrium, uh, from a calculational standpoint, which we won't be doing a lot of in this lab, uh, from that calculational standpoint, though, there, there are things that we can talk about here. Uh, we often will talk about an equilibrium constant, uh, and basically what this is, this is going to be a ratio of the amounts of products to, to reactants that are going to be present at equilibrium. And it turns out for any given reaction, as long as it's at the same temperature, that ratio of reactants to products should always come out to be the same ratio, uh, regardless of how many reactants or products you actually started the reaction with. So uh, to look at how we would go about calculating that, because it is a little bit strange the first time you see it, uh, first thing I'll kind of point out here, this is a capital K for our equilibrium constant. I know we just finished doing rate constants uh, with kinetics, which are lowercase k's. And it is a bit annoying to always have K kind of as our constant a lot this semester, but uh, capital K for our equilibrium constant, excuse me, our equilibrium constant. You will sometimes see a C or a P subscript, uh, which will kind of notify you if you're using concentrations or pressures uh, for that equilibrium constant. So if you don't see KEQ, it might be KC or KP. Uh, that's just telling you like KC, we're using concentrations for all of these. We could use pressures instead. Uh, now, for us in this lab, we're going to be focusing mainly on KC or like really our equilibrium constant, just using concentrations of things. Uh, and so in terms of how we calculate that equilibrium constant, it's just going to be basically all of the products divided by all the reactants. But for, your, for both uh, reactants and products, they're going to be raised to their coefficients power from the balanced reaction. So stoichiometry does play a role here uh, in terms of calculating this ratio. And this is the ratio then that will always be constant for a particular reaction, regardless of what, whether you're starting with lots of reactants or lots of products, doesn't really matter. Now your end ratio will always come out to kind of the same value. That's what we call then this equilibrium constant. Now, two last things. Uh, when we're calculating equilibrium constant, uh, all those concentrations for our lab, like or for like a, in another case, we're using gases and we have pressures. Uh, those values for the concentrations and the pressures have to be the equilibrium values. So you already have to be at equilibrium for the numbers that you're plugging in. Um, for us today, again, we're not really going to be doing the calculation too much itself, so that's not a big deal. Uh, but we will be talking about something called a reaction quotient here in a second that will, will be important for comparing what, what's happening to our reactions if we disturb an equilibrium. Uh, the other part I wanted to point out here, uh, I made this comment over here as far as like pure solids or liquids. If you have a pure solid, like a solid doesn't really have a concentration or a pressure ever. So like our pure solids in, the, in this equation, like if C was a solid, instead of having C to like the little c power, this would all just be one. So like pure solids, pure liquids, turns out they actually don't really affect equilibrium at all. Uh, and so we're just basically putting in a one for them in this equation. So that means they don't really ever change the equilibrium either. Uh, so like adding just a, a pure solid that stays a solid and doesn't do anything, like it's not going to affect the equilibrium. Uh, liquids, you have to be a little more careful with. If you add a pure liquid, it usually won't change anything either. But that's really mainly in the case if the liquid is the solvent in that case. So for like an aqueous solution, if you add water, it shouldn't really do too much to the equilibrium uh, in terms of uh, kind of what's happening unless you're really drastically changing concentrations of the individual reactants. That might have an impact on things. Uh, but in general, like adding a pure liquid, usually not going to have too big of an impact on the reaction itself. Uh, but if you add a liquid, say like in one, we'll see this in kind of our last equilibrium, if you add liquid water to an equilibrium that where the solvent is not water, it's something else, now we might actually see some changes because that is going to be a reactant in that reaction we see, and I'll, I'll kind of re-highlight that when we get to it. All right, the reaction quotient. So this is what we're going to really be taking a bigger look at today. Um, the reaction quotient we label with a capital Q, uh, and this is basically we're going to calculate the exact same way we would an equilibrium constant, so like those products over the reactants, everything raised to its coefficients power. Um, but the difference is for Q, we just plug in whatever our current conditions are. Uh, and the reason we do this is this now lets us compare the reaction quotient and the equilibrium constant. 
to really figure out what is our reaction going to do in order to reach equilibrium. Uh, because if our Q value, our reaction quotient, is too small, it's less than the equilibrium constant, what that means is we don't have enough products yet since we calculate both of these by products over reactants. So we need to make more products. That means the reaction will go forward. If Q is too big already, that means they already have more products than what we should. So the reaction will actually go backwards in order to get to equilibrium at that point. Then we do have a third possibility where these two things are equal. Uh, and if Q and K are equal, that means our situation that we're looking at, we're already at equilibrium. So the reaction is not going to kind of do anything uh, in particular to try and reach an equilibrium state because it's already there. Now, our focus for today's experiment is going to be on what we call the Chatelier's principle. Uh, so there's kind of a lengthy definition text-wise here. Uh, the biggest thing here is if you have a system that's at equilibrium and you do something to kind of disturb it or disrupt that equilibrium in some way, uh, the most common ways usually of doing this are going to be like adding a reactant or adding a product, maybe changing volume or pressure or even temperature. Uh, what's going to happen is if you disturb the equilibrium, your reaction is going to respond by trying to get back to equilibrium. And we often call it, it's going to shift in kind of a forward or backwards direction to try and reestablish an equilibrium balance. Uh, and so to kind of think about this from the reaction quotient equilibrium constant perspective, anytime you do something that's going to affect the value of Q, so that Q is no longer equal to your equilibrium constant, your reaction is going to respond. And it's always going to respond in a way that Q and KQ are going to end up getting equal to each other again. So if by changing a concentration or a pressure or even temperature, you can tell that, oh, my, effect, my reaction quotient has gotten smaller. So in order to get back to equilibrium, it's going to have to get bigger again. So I know the reaction has to go forward. Um, this can be one way to try and think about uh, what reactions are going to do when we disrupt their equilibrium. Uh, there's another way that we'll talk about here in a second kind of visually from our experiment uh, as we do experiments we can look kind of for colors if that's an available option so we can really just try and look and see like, which way is the reaction shifting based on what we've done uh, and you kind of we hopefully reason through that then too as far as like adding different things or taking things out of reactions so to, to take a little bit deeper look into this and as far as how equilibrium kind of shifts or how reactions shift to get to equilibrium let's say we have a reaction that's just simply a going to be uh, just kind of the simplest reaction we can really write so if we were to write our reaction quotient kind of equation, we'd have the concentration B over the concentration of A, which all of this should equal our equilibrium constant at equilibrium. Well, now if we were to do something to change our equilibrium, let's say we add A. We're going to add more of our reactant, right? So if we add more reactant from our equation here, this concentration gets bigger. That means Q gets smaller. And we know if Q is too small, then that means the reaction has to go forward to get to equilibrium, right? Because we basically need more product if we've now added a bunch of reactant. And so it's kind of a, a nice, easy, general rule of thumb. Anytime you add a reactant or even a product, the reaction is always going to shift the opposite direction. So adding something to the left side of the reaction causes the reaction to shift towards the right side to kind of reestablish that equilibrium balance. And so we'll always kind of see that happen. And then the opposite of that is, let's say we remove A. So taking away a reactant or a product. Um, usually this is going to be done by what we call a competing reaction. So for instance, let's say A is an acid of some kind. If we add a hydroxide, acids are going to react with a base, so the hydroxide will basically cause A to react in some way that's not the equilibrium we're looking at, so that's going to effectively take A out of the equilibrium. So if A's concentration gets smaller for this equilibrium, Q gets bigger, and now if Q is too big, the reaction actually has to go backwards. So anything that removes a reactant or a product from the equilibrium, the reaction is always going to shift towards whatever's getting removed. So Adding something that's part of our reaction causes it to shift the opposite direction of what we add. Removing something by some kind of competitive reaction is always going to cause the reaction to shift towards what's getting removed again, just trying to reestablish the balance that was initially there. Uh, and then the last thing I'll mention here, like Q does have to change for there to be kind of any kind of reaction shift for equilibrium. Uh, so like changing the amount of a pure solid in a balanced reaction doesn't actually do anything. Same if we kind of like uh, affect like a pure liquid or a solvent doesn't really have an effect. Uh, unless we're doing something drastic to kind of the overall volume or concentration of the individual reactants and products. All right, the other impact that we're going to take a look at in today's experiment, besides just kind of adding reactants or products or adding something that's going to do a, co a competitive reaction, uh, is going to be changing temperature. So for temperature, really what we need to know for a reaction is whether it's endothermic or exothermic, or in the, kind of the case of our experiment this week, we just really need to know, uh, or really we can try and determine whether something's endothermic or exothermic based on how a reaction responds to temperature change. Uh, and so the ways we can kind of look at this to try and examine it, uh, if we have a reaction that's endothermic, uh, that basically means the reaction needs heat to happen. And so we can really just treat the heat like a reactant. 
Uh, if we have something that's exothermic, it's just the opposite. That's something that gives off heat. So now we can treat our heat as a product instead. Uh, now, if we kind of take this viewpoint, now we're able to see like uh, if we know what's happening to the temperature and if we know our reaction is endothermic or exothermic, we can predict which way it should shift kind of as a response. Uh, we can treat it just basically the same way that we did on the previous slide. Uh, whereas we were adding like a reactant or a product. So for instance, if we know a reaction is exothermic and we heat it up, adding heat's like adding a product, adding a reactant or a product makes it shift the opposite way. So we'd actually make more reactants if we heated up an exothermic reaction that was at equilibrium. Uh, likewise for us today, what we're gonna kind of take a look at is if we can figure out how heat causes a reaction to shift. So say adding a heat causes more products to be made, now we can look at, all right, well, if we add heat, which of these reaction types would cause more products to be made? Well, adding heat to an endothermic reaction is like adding a reactant. They'll shift it towards products. Uh, and so anything that we add heat and make more products should be an endothermic reaction. That's what we want to be looking at really for today's experiment is as we add heat or as we cool something down, like which way does the reaction shift? And then because of that, we can figure out uh, what's going to happen uh, in terms of whether a reaction being endothermic or exothermic. All right, now. For the experiment we're actually going to be taking a look at today, uh, we're going to be looking at three different equilibrium systems, and I'll highlight all of them here in front of the upcoming three slides. Uh, but really what we're going to be doing for each one is we're just going to be looking at the impact of adding different reactants or products or just other compounds that may cause a competitive reaction to see what visually happens to equilibrium. Uh, we'll also be taking a look at temperature effect, kind of like what I just explained a second ago. And really for all of these in the experiment, we're going to be looking at color changes to help us know what's going to be happening with our reaction. So for each of these reactions, I'm going to kind of go into like what, what's really going on color-wise and how we can use that to help us figure out uh, and explain maybe what's going on from kind of a conceptual standpoint. So the first equilibrium we'll take a look at in the lab is uh, really an equilibrium involving bisulfate. Uh, if you take bisulfate in water, it does actually dissociate kind of into its ions. We basically get a proton and we get the sulfate ion. And so we're going to use an indicator that's called thymol blue, and indicators are things that basically can change colors depending on diff different variables of what's in the solution. Usually it's going to depend on how much H plus is in the solution. In our case for thymol blue, if, if we have just HSO4 minus, like just the bisulfate by itself, it's probably going to look kind of a yellowish orange color. Uh, and if we, the more H plus that we get in our solution, the more this thing breaks apart, basically the more red or purple our color is likely to look instead. Um, and so that's kind of what we hope to see or expect to see. Uh, in terms of like a, the color changes. So if we make our different changes and our solution gets more yellow orange in color, uh, we expect to, that's shifting it towards the left side of our equation. If we make add something to our reaction or do some change to the reaction, it gets kind of a darker or red or purple color. That means it's shifting the reaction towards the product side. Uh, and so here, one thing I will note for thymol blue, it doesn't really, you're probably not gonna see the huge color changes. Uh, and so probably what you're likely to see instead uh, is that you're gonna see just kind of lightening and darkening. So you're gonna go from like here, you can see kind of like a darker shade to a lighter shade. So you're probably gonna see transitions really just going lighter to darker between kind of red and purple shades. Uh, it's probably what's most likely. And so if it's getting darker, that's more towards kind of the purple end, that means kind of product side. If it's getting a lighter shade of color, it's more like yellow orange, uh, that's more towards the reactant side. So those are the kind of things you can look for in that first equilibrium to try and figure out which direction is the reaction shifting based on the colors that you see. Uh, for our second equilibrium, we're gonna be looking at magnesium hydroxide. And initially, the magnesium hydroxide here on the left, this is kind of a white cloudy solid. So when you first make this solution, you hopefully should see a small amount of white kind of cloudiness in that solution. Uh, and then your product side, we have magnesium, hydro or magnesium ions and hydroxide ions. This is all colorless. So you have basically one side that's colorless, one side's kind of a cloudy white solid. Uh, and so when you do things like add the acid or add the EDTA, you can really see like, is it getting cloudier or is it getting clear? And if it's getting clear, it's favoring the right side. If it's getting cloudy, it's favoring the left. Um, now, we will be using phenylphthalein uh, as far as uh, for, I think, one or two of the portions of this e uh, experiment for this equilibrium. And phenylphthalein is something that, in the presence of a lot of hydroxide, turns a very intense, like, pink or almost even dark purple color. And so, like, the darker that pink or purple color gets, the more hydroxide that's there. And if it's getting darker, that means we're making more hydroxide. We've shifted towards the product side. If that pink shade is getting lighter in color, or if it's going clear entirely, in that case with the phenylphthalein, that's actually favoring the reactant side here because that means there's not very much hydroxide in the solution. Uh, one other note I will make here, uh, we do use something called EDTA, uh, ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. And this compound is uh, probably one that most are familiar with. And so what it, what it really does is it reacts with metal ions. So adding this EDTA 
really is just going to be a, uh, reacting with the magnesium 2 plus uh, in the solution in this particular case. <clears throat> All right, for our last equilibrium, uh, we're going to be taking a look at uh, our cobalt uh, equilibrium. And so for this cobalt reaction, what we're going to have is this is the one that's a little bit different because we don't have water as the solvent this time. Notice we see this ETAOH for this, uh, basically the uh, physical state for all of these. All of these are dissolved in an alcohol, ethanol. Uh, and so ETOH is kind of a common abbreviation that we use for ethanol. Now, what we're going to be doing in this one, we're reacting this cobalt chloride compound, which is a really, really blue color just on its own. And we're going to react it with just water. Uh, and what should happen uh, if you do this reaction, you're probably going to see your solution turn kind of a lighter, almost like a clear solution, but it'll have like kind of like a pink shading to it uh, as far as kind of like your two extremes. So like without any water, this cobalt compound is very, very blue. Add water, this thing does turn uh, a pretty pink color. Uh, and so here's kind of a, a quick comparison. Like I said, very dark blue for the cobalt initially. The pink here is actually once we've added a decent amount of water to make the product side of the reaction. Now, <clears throat> when you're doing this, keep in mind, since water is not the solvent, adding water is kind of like adding a normal reactant. So it is a little bit different in terms of probably what it's going to do to your equilibrium mixture. Uh, and the other thing I'll point out here, you will be using silver nitrate as one of the things you add to this reaction. Uh, and if you're trying to figure out like, well, what exactly is the silver nitrate gonna do? Like there's no silver anywhere, there's no nitrate ions anywhere. Uh, kind of thing, if you think back to 1211, like silver in particular is pretty good at doing precipitation reactions. So that is what's actually gonna, gonna happen here as well. Uh, and so I will let you guys kind of look at this reaction a little bit to kind of figure out what precipitation reaction you think should happen. Uh, but there is gonna be a precipitation reaction uh, and if it's going to cause a reaction, remember, whatever the silver is effectively going to react with, it's like it's removing it from the equilibrium, and now you can kind of figure out which direction should a reaction shift as a result. Um, and so again, you should see hopefully color changes. You might not see it go totally blue or totally pink. Um, you might see, again, just kind of like a lightening and a darkening of the solution, like the lighter color favoring kind of the pink, the darker color favoring more of the blue uh, for your different sides of your reaction. So kind of, again, keep that in mind as you're looking for your comparisons. Uh, the last couple things I'm going to mention here, because really that's the whole experiment, is just kind of making those observations and comparisons uh, and trying to kind of reason through and see, like, you know, do these changes make sense for what you're doing for your reactions? Uh, the last couple things that I'll mention here are going to regard safety and kind of waste disposal. Uh, we are going to be using acids and bases, but we're using really tiny amounts of these things, uh, and none of the concentrations are really all that high. I think we might have concentrated hydrochloric, which might be... Uh, the only thing that's not a small concentration or a low concentration. Uh, so we do want to be careful with using the acids and bases. If you feel any like tingling sensations or if your hands feel slippery at all, it means you probably have one of the acids or the sodium hydroxide on your hands. Just go ahead and wash them off. Uh, again, none of the concentrations or the amount should be high enough to really cause any kind of real harm. Uh, the other thing to kind of pay attention to in this lab handling wise is silver nitrate. So you will not feel it basically if you touch it with your skin, but silver nitrate eventually will turn your skin black. Uh, and so like you will, like uh, probably initially if you get a lot of it on, you might turn your skin actually slightly white. Uh, and then if it's exposed to sunlight anytime over the next like 24 hours, 48 hours, it'll probably then turn the skin black instead. Uh, and so if you're not careful handling some of these things and if you're not wearing gloves, if you get a little silver nitrate in your like hand or in your arm and then kind of notice a day or two later, it's like, hey, I have these black splotches on my hand, like what happened? Uh, it's probably silver nitrate. Uh, it's not something that's gonna be like really harmful or anything like that. Uh, it, even unless you yeah, spilled like a lot of it on yourself, it's not even going to like burn or blister or anything like that. So nothing really bad is going to happen. It's going to like look kind of, kind of weird or off-putting for, for maybe a few days and then it will go away. Uh, and like everything will kind of return to normal and it's not like toxic long-term or anything of that sort. So uh, just to give people a heads up on that, if that's something you're worried about or just to give you an idea, like if it, if it does happen, uh, sometimes people will spill silver nitrate in the lab and not clean it up. So uh, just do take extra precaution kind of handling these things, both for your own sake and for the sake of others. Like if you spill something, do go ahead and clean it up for others so that they're not going to be exposed to things. Uh, last note then here on waste. Uh, all the equilibrium mixtures, once you're kind of done looking at everything and doing the different parts of the experiment, can, uh, has to go into the waste container. Nothing in this lab can go down the sink. So everything into the waste. And as you're cleaning things, try to use the deionized water. So the water from either the squirt bottles or the little tiny spigot at kind of the very uh, last uh, sink back by the kind of normal waste hood. Uh, just use DI water for everything. Because if you're using just tap water, there's sometimes other ions there that can maybe kind of skew some of these equilibrium mixtures uh, and make the results for some of the following labs then maybe be a little bit weird or strange. So try to use deionized water for everything. Make sure everything goes in the waste. Uh, and other than that, hopefully this lab, I think, isn't, isn't too bad. It's really it's on the short side, uh, and hopefully it'll be pretty straightforward and get to see a lot of kind of nice pretty colors as you're going through it as well.